odd at some point, then this incident might not have arrived in the first place. So we have to just balance that. But I certainly will have a, a look at all these regulations. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Michael Russell on chair protection. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary were to press the request to speak button now. And I'll just give a few moments for the front benches to settle themselves. I now call on uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Michael Russell, 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there is no doubt that every member in this chamber is absolutely committed to ensuring the well-being and the happiness of every child in Scotland. That's not so much a policy objective as a moral imperative, and it unites the vast majority of humankind. And, Presiding Officer, that moral imperative includes a demand on us to do everything we can in whatever position we find ourselves to protect those at risk of sexual exploitation and abuse, and to ensure that individuals responsible for such appalling actions face the full rigour of the law. There can therefore be no question that this government, like its predecessor, is completely and fully committed to doing everything it can to ensure that all parts of Scottish life, and in particular all parts of the public sector in Scotland, are working together in an agile and responsive way to protect every child and young person from abuse, whatever form it takes. Two weeks ago, I delivered the Scottish Government's response to the action plan developed by the Scottish Human Rights Commission interaction process. On that afternoon, I met with survivors of child abuse, sexual, physical and emotional, to listen to their demands of government and society. I was very affected by their stories, by their courage, by their commitment and sometimes by their anger. But most of all, I was affected by one who said to me that what he wanted more than anything else was to go from being a survivor to being able to live and thrive. That's what he and many others really want. That's what we have to help make happen, person by person, issue by issue, place by place. And we'll only do so if we approach this topic with a ruthless determination to see the truth told and the record written, in order that there can be full accountability, surrounded by the best of support and a holistic approach to healing. I can say, presiding officer, that the Scottish Government has accepted the main recommendations of the unique interaction process. I pay strong tribute to Alan Miller and his colleagues in the Scottish Human Rights Commission and to the work of the Centre of Excellence that looked after children in Scotland, as well as to the agencies and the survivors who have taken part in a difficult and unique process which has resulted in a clear way forward. As a result of that process, I can tell the Chamber today that we've committed to lead the development of a national support fund for survivors of historic abuse and care, working with survivors and organisations on the most appropriate model. We've agreed to fund an appropriate commemoration after actively engaging with survivors and relevant organisations on the format this should take. We'll give full consideration to the merits of an apology law con con and continue to work constructively with Margaret Mitchell, MSP, as her detailed proposals for an apologies bill are developed. We've committed to working with the legal profession and survivors to try and understand why there may be barriers around the exercising of judicial discretion in terms of time bar. We'll review the lessons learned of previous inquiries. We'll ensure that the people who speak about their experiences in institutional care as children will have this recounted through the National Confidential Forum's published reports. And we'll do so by joining with the survivors and the agencies in taking these issues forward together. As a government, we'll continue the involvement of the three ministers who have been part of this so far, Michael Matheson, the Minister for Public Health, Rosanna Cunningham, the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and Aileen Campbell, the Minister for Children and Young People, working with me to provide a cross-government team of participants. And I use that word advisedly, Presiding Officer. This is not a process that is completed. I've given a strong commitment to ensure that the views and experiences of the survivors is integral to the decision-making and action processes going forward. Government will be part of a wider grouping, ensuring that we deliver, as is our responsibility, but remaining within the process that is much greater than government alone. And that particularly applies to the one issue that's still unresolved from the interaction process. There's been much debate as to whether a further inquiry should take place into historic abuse in Scotland. The interaction process produced a new paper on the matter in August after a special session to consider the issue. This took a clear and unequivocal stance in favour of an inquiry, and I respect that view. However, it suggested a very different type of inquiry from that which is usually established by statute and by government. 
I've spent a considerable time in the last few weeks examining that suggestion. I've consulted uh, colleagues and professionals from a variety of areas, including social work, childcare, health and the law. I believe there are still issues that require to be resolved before a final decision can be made on whether a further inquiry is appropriate, and if so, of what type. Some of those issues need continued input by the survivors. Of course, Presiding Officer, the Shaw Review, which reported in November 2007, and the Kerr Law Inquiry, which reported in May 2009, have already considered some aspects of these matters in Scotland. I've therefore asked the Scottish Human Rights Commission to reconvene an urgent meeting of the Interaction Group to focus on those matters which still have to be resolved, with a view to allowing government to reach a final decision. I've also heard from some survivors outside the Interaction process about this issue, strongly in support of an inquiry, it has to be said, and I'll continue to seek and listen to such views as well. It's vital that this issue is resolved properly and positively. We can only see too clearly what has happened elsewhere when governments have taken an ex cathedra stance on an inquiry and how it should go forward without listening and exploring enough. There are good examples of much better processes elsewhere, for example, in Northern Ireland and Australia, and we need to look at those too, and I will therefore return to the Chamber on this matter before Christmas. However, the inquiry is only one aspect of this issue. History mustn't be allowed to repeat itself, so the Scottish Government is equally committed to understanding current threats and criminal activity and how we stand against them. We're working closely in partnership with those across Scotland who have the greatest expertise in these matters, providing national leadership and coordination while being guided by those whose everyday work is with children and families in communities across Scotland. That means working with a wide range of people, including the third sector, local government, health service, and Police Scotland. Now, all those organisations have worked with us on the first national action plan on child sexual exploitation, which we're publishing today. This work has been informed by the J report into child sexual exploitation in Rotherham, which is one of the reasons why it's taken a little longer than expected. The action plan isn't a panacea to tackling child sexual exploitation. There is no single solution. However, the action plan represents a critical milestone outlining tangible steps for useful action that will move us forward in our efforts to tackle this vital concern. For example, I'm pleased to announce today our commitment to work with partners to develop a national awareness campaign on child protection. And we'll be looking to work with Police Scotland to develop guidance on child sexual exploitation indicators for nighttime economy staff, such as taxi drivers and hotel workers who come into increased first-hand contact with children and young people at especially vulnerable times. The recent establishment of the Police Scotland National Child Abuse Investigation Unit is another key innovation, which will provide national specialist support on all child abuse investigations identified across the country. Police Scotland will have the specialist capability to investigate and target both current cases and cases where historic accusations of criminality are brought forward. This parallels the establishment of the Specialised National Sexual Crimes Unit by the Crown Office. Improving outcomes for children is a long road to travel. As we take steps here in Scotland to make each change, we'll continue to pay attention to the developing discourse elsewhere. We'll ensure that we're well-placed to respond to emerging findings and new examples of best practice. We'll reflect on how best the experience of others can be adapted to circumstances here. Earlier in the summer, ministers asked the Care Inspectorate to update us on the effectiveness of local arrangements for protecting children and adults. The Commission's report into child protection was published last week. It's very helpful, it highlights some excellent work, but also potential barriers to improvements in protecting children and young people. That will inform everything we do. And additionally, in the context of the specific inquiries into historic child sexual abuse taking place elsewhere in the UK, I commissioned the, in July, I commissioned the Chief Executive of Children in Scotland, Jackie Brock, to take an independent look at the working of the Scottish child protection system as developed by recent legislation. The purpose of the report was to examine how robust our child protection systems are and to identify areas of improvement. Ms Brock's report usefully complements that of the Care Inspectorate, considering the strategic issues in delivering child protection services efficiently and consistently across the country. It offers 12 recommendations about how the Scottish Government and partners can do this more effectively. I'm also publishing that report today. I can confirm that I am supportive of all its recommendations. I will, for example, bring together the Chief Officers of the 32 Community Planning Partnerships, the Chief Officers of the Shadow Integrated Health and Social Care Partnerships, and the Child Protection Committee Chairs in a summit to be held this year. Presiding Officer, it's fair to say that the vast majority of children will have safe and happy childhoods without the intervention of public services or third sector agencies other than through normal health care and schooling. 
For those other children, however, it's essential that we're able to identify and support their needs from the earliest possible age, and a preventative approach has long been the bedrock of our system. That's best expressed, of course, in GERFEC, getting it right for every child. That's our national approach to improving the well-being of children. It's developed across several administrations and in partnership with agent, statutory agencies and the third sector. It's improving our early warning systems. It's helping us to pick up on the signs of need more quickly. It allows services to make appropriate responses to prevent risk becoming realities. This entire chamber should embrace it wholeheartedly. In conclusion, presiding officer, some dreadful things happened in Scotland over many years to children who deserved so much better from those in positions of trust. Jack McConnell made an appropriate and heartfelt apology in this chamber in 2004 on behalf of the nation and us all. We must never forget what took place. We need to have an awareness of it that means it can never be repeated. We need to prosecute those who were guilty so that they can never re-offend. And we need to place in permanence the truth about who was accountable so that others never fail again. But we also need to help those who suffered to move from surviving to living and thriving. We all need to come together around that ambition to ensure, ensure that Scotland is and will from this time on be the best place for each and every child to grow up. That work isn't done yet. I've reported on substantial progress here today. I will come back to the Chamber to report on the outstanding issue of the inquiry, as well as to update the Chamber from time to time about how the detail of these processes are being worked out and implemented. We can never do enough for those who have suffered, but by working with them, we can at least try to make a difference for the pain of the past, a difference to our practice in the present, and a difference to our plans for the future. And I am, of course, presiding officer, happy to answer questions on this statement. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary has said you'll now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow you until about 2.50 uh, for questions. Uh, Graham Pearson. Yeah, thank you, presiding officer. And I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of of his uh, deliberation uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm also pleased to acknowledge that he is taking the lead in this matter uh, in order that we can finally deliver on the hopes of survivors across Scotland in relation to this very important issue. Uh, I'm pleased to associate myself too with the words of support that the Cabinet Secretary has offered to all of those who have contributed to decisions that he has acknowledged today, uh, but would add also individual survivors and survivors groups who have helped so much. Uh, I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will be able to give us further detail of the action plan and, importantly, implementation dates because too often uh, survivors and others involved in this situation have not known when something was due to occur and when it would be delivered. As the Cabinet Secretary indicated, uh, a survivor did want to live and thrive, but many of the survivors I have spoken to also want an answer into how and why the abuse they suffered was allowed to continue. And the answer to that question, I think, gives us best opportunity to protect vulnerable children for the future. Uh, Cabinet Secretary mentions the initiation of a, a support fund. Uh, I would welcome more detail of who would contribute to that support fund, because I think there are a number of organisations and agencies who should do well to show a willingness to contribute and fully contribute. Uh, the commemoration that he, he mentions, I would hope that that commemoration would take on board not only those survivors who are living, but those who are unfortunate enough to have already taken their own lives in the years that have gone past, unable to uh, content themselves with the future, knowing what they had suffered. Supporting survivors to understand their interaction plan is something that the Cabinet Secretary uh, indicated in his statement. I've got to say it sounded uh, a deal uh, condescending, and I hope that he will explain that more fully, because I'm sure that he didn't mean it in, in the way it looks in the cold light of, of the uh, statement. Uh, many survivors will be uh, uh, looking forward to the introduction of a public inquiry. Uh, Christmas can't come soon enough for them and they believe that a public inquiry will give us a full understanding of why we are where we are 
and how we can prevent the future from uh, recurring in the way it seems to have done in the decades that have gone past. I am very grateful that this statement has been made, made today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to respond? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there are a number of points I would respond to, first of all, in terms of supporting survivors. This is, uh, the interaction process is exactly what it says it is. It is interactive. And, and therefore, it is important the government is part of that. But there is mutual support uh, by all those involved, and there will continue to be. The point about helping survivors to understand the action plan is to widen the impact of the action plan, because not every survivor is, of course, a member of the interaction process. Um, in terms of the inquiry, can I, can I just commend to the member something I referred to, which is the Interaction Survivors event uh, report from the 27th of August, uh, titled Views on Inquiry, and I'm happy to play, make sure a copy of this is available in SPICE. This is an important document. What it tells us is the, the, the issues that the interaction process is considering in terms of the importance of things that need to be heard in an inquiry. And if I may just quote one or two of them, presenting officer, an important. Survivors' experiences being publicly heard and acknowledged is an important part of that. Enhancing public understanding of institutional child abuse, giving agencies the opportunity to tell the story of not only what took place, but how they have changed. Helping the mental health of survivors, quantifying the extent of abuse. And, and very importantly, a line in here which I think we should all reflect on, justice is more than apology or money. It is ensuring that there is a national record that we can move forward on. Now, this is not a conventional inquiry. And therefore, we need to address this in a very different way. And that is why we need to consider how this could be done, given that the legislation, as the member will know, that surrounds this public inquiries is very different and focused on very different outcomes. So that is why we'll take some time to resolve this. Uh, just in terms of the action plan, it is published today. There is detail in the action plan of the timescale. If I can just quote from the action plan itself, timescales for achieving actions on the action plan differ. A number have already been successfully achieved, some of a longer time frame attached. There is clarity within this document about that. And finally, on the issue of a support fund and commemoration. There are a number of international models, for example, the Irish model on the, on the fund. Uh, it, it will require a number of partners to be uh, involved in this. That is negotiation that myself and my colleagues are going to undertake uh, with the um, interaction process. And government will play a role, both in being part of the fund, but also making sure that we are able to negotiate a wider involvement. And that is what we will do. Lynette Milne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advance copy of his statement. Um, we too welcome the response made by the Government to the Scottish Human Rights Commission Interaction Plan, and we appreciate his comments on my colleague Margaret Mitchell's hard work with her apologies bill. Um, we also welcome his acceptance of the recommendations in the Children in, Scot children in Scotland's report, particularly that the focus should be on children who are vulnerable and on the radar, in other words, children who are living at home but are known to children's services. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's explanation as to why the Government doesn't believe that a further inquiry into cases of historic child abuse in Scotland is necessary at this point in time. Can I ask him if further cases do come forward which relate specifically to Scotland, will he confirm that such an inquiry hasn't been fully ruled out? Um, and can I also ask, as a member of the Health and Sport Committee at the time that the National Confidential Forum for Survivors of Institutionalised Abuse was set up, what reports he's received regarding individuals coming forward to use the forum, whether he can provide the Chamber with an update on its progress, and would he consider now extending access to the forum for children in foster and kinship care? The uh, Confidential Forum will start taking referrals next month, so that is the timescale. Of course, that's established in legislation. Can I just be clear about what I have said on the inquiry? Because I think the statement is clear, and I, I think the presiding officer Nett Mill just misinterpreted it slightly. I have indicated that I take no position uh, presently on the final decision on a further inquiry. I have indicated that I think there is a strong and persuasive case coming from the interaction uh, process, and there are also other cases being made. I have committed myself to continue to listen to that, to have further discussions. The interaction process is coming back together to discuss this. There is work to be done uh, across the whole areas involved in this in terms of a very different type of inquiry from the type of inquiry that uh, convention is established, for example, under the 2005 Act. And I will come back to the Chamber to report further on that. I don't want it to be taken that I have taken a position on it. Uh, this is 
if, if the member will read this paper and will consider it, it is a different thing that is being proposed from what has gone before. I think it is, I don't think we can undervalue the unique nature of the interaction process and how important it has been, but there are other considerations that need to come in, so I'll come back with that. Uh, simply in terms of the action plan, can I just make sure everybody is entirely clear on this? There is the action plan on child sexual exploitation that is ongoing, uh, what is happening now, and that's what we've published today in response to the P Petitions Committee, which Mr. Stewart will, will know about. Uh, and of course, there is interaction process about historic sex abuse. Now, there are links between those matters, but let us be clear in our mind about a number of things which are linked by appalling behavior and criminal behavior, but which are different and require different approaches. Roderick Campbell, followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary at the Justice Committee on the 7th of October, uh, echoing Professor Jay, we heard evidence from the Crown Office that it's undoubtedly true that low conviction levels did not necessarily mean low levels of child sexual exploitation. Uh, do you agree that there is a public concern as to the extent of child sexual abuse and that information gathering on the subject is vital? Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely agree with that, uh, that member. I think it is dangerous to make assumptions about the level of abuse of any description. I've, I've seen some slightly careless remarks, I think, about whether or not levels of abuse are taking place, for example, on what is called a Rotherham level or whatever. I think we have to be very, very careful about this. Uh, you know, and, and the police are determined to prosecute and to secure a conviction of anybody you know, uh, who is accused in this matter if they are guilty. So we have to be just very careful about assumptions we made about uh, the scale of what we're talking about. Um, it is true that a low conviction level does not necessarily mean low uh, levels of child sexual abuse, but equally it does not necessarily mean that there are higher levels of child sexual abuse. What I do agree with the member absolutely is that we have to make sure that there is information available about what is taking place and we have to have our eyes and ears fully open. And when I make the point about uh, the nighttime economy workers, we need to enlist in this process people across Scotland because one of the level lessons, one of the many lessons, if you read the Rotherham report, is that people found it difficult to take their minds from where they were to what to, they saw in front of them. And we need to make sure that people are prepared to do that. That does require us sometimes to think things we would rather not think, but we do need to do so. So I commend the member for saying information gathering is vital. Awareness, perhaps, is a word I would use, is even more vital. Neil Bibby, followed by Liam MacArthur. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Scotland is the only part of the UK that currently does not have an uh, inquiry into historic institutional abuse. This is obviously not a new issue and, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, uh, the First Minister Jack McConnell gave an apology in 2004. A number of my constituents have been calling for such an inquiry for a number of years, a call which I support. We have already seen millions of pounds spent on reports, frameworks and consultations to look at the best way uh, forward. Given this, could the Cabinet Secretary uh, list and give more details to the Chamber on exactly what he feels needs to be resolved before a final decision on an inquiry can be made? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, of course, I, I use the term further inquiry advisedly. Uh, there have been two inquiries. There have been a range of reviews and investigations, uh, and there has, of course, been a very active process of prosecution. So I'm sure the member didn't mean to give the impression that nothing has happened, because a great deal has happened. It arose out of that um, apology and out of other things taking place. But I would commend to the member the interaction process. This has been a unique process. I regard myself as very privileged as having, although I've only come into it towards the very end, very privileged at seeing what has taken place, because it has been uh, quite extraordinary how the agencies, survivors, and others have come together to negotiate and discuss a careful way forward. And I'm very struck by this paper that they have produced on an inquiry, which was very late in their process, um, and, and that has changed my thinking. And I think it's extremely important that we think carefully when we are presented with information and evidence. Now, I think the issues that need to be resolved, I've indicated some of them in my, my statement, but they include whether there is any statutory, any law in existence at the moment that can 
necessarily underpin this different type of inquiry. For example, in Northern Ireland, the members referred to what is taking place in other jurisdictions. In Northern Ireland, there was a specific piece of legislation passed that essentially tailored the inquiry to what was needed. It did not fit into the straitjacket of existing legislation. I think it's fair to say that if you look at the 2005 Act, it is very good legislation in terms of inquiring into things of which you can ask a clear and specified question. For example, how did an accident take place? How did a disaster take place? You can ask those questions. But when you're looking at, for example, issues such as the, the, the public acknowledgement of wrong and the enhancing public understanding, those are not clear questions to be answered. So I think what we have to do is to discuss with the inter through the interaction process how we could shape this inquiry. I also would not commend the approach that's been taken south of the border. There we seem to have had a decision on an inquiry and its remit, uh, which was announced ex cathedra and told to those people who were most affected. And I don't think that's the right way to do it. And I don't think that's how the Scottish Parliament would want to do it. So let's take the time to discuss this and to see what the right way forward is. And that's what I intend to do over the new next few weeks, but I have set a timescale for that, very deliberately, so that I can come back to this chamber before Christmas and, and, and conclude one way or the other and explain that conclusion and to be open to question from this chamber about that conclusion. Neil MacArthur, followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, can I too um, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement and the action plan. It's clear a considerable amount of work has been done by a variety of groups and a significant amount of thought gone into this complex question. Can I also um, uh, commend uh, his suggestion that a strong and persuasive case is emerging, uh, possibly for a further inquiry. But the Care Inspectorate highlighted serious shortcomings with planning of child protection services, stalled or deteriorated progress, and important or major weaknesses in the effectiveness of initial responses. The report also highlighted that social workers who have been in the job as little as one month were having to deal with complex cases. Mr Russell has referred to further training for professionals, but does he agree that there is need for urgent action to look at whether or not the correct skills mix within uh, local teams is there to ensure experienced social workers are paired with or working alongside uh, those who are newly qualified? Yes, I, I don't have any difficulty with acknowledging that uh, whilst there were positive things in, in the report, there were things that required ur urgent attention. That is why you know, there is a team of ministers involved in this. This is why Aileen Campbell met with the Care Inspector today, uh, this lunchtime, uh, which we're putting in place the actions that are required to take this forward. So I can assure the member that we want to make sure that where criticisms exist, then we'll make sure they're attended to. I do not believe that social workers with very limited experience should be exposed to the most difficult of cases. I've spent part of this year uh, in my role as, as having responsibility for social work, meeting frontline social workers across Scotland in a variety of, of private discussions, which have persuaded me of a number of things. One is the very high quality of social work staff that we have in Scotland. But secondly, the fact that those staff can, for example, suffer from burnout, uh, and can be placed in positions where they are not able uh, to fully respond. So we need to make sure that we are supporting them. And last week I met with a group of directors of social work to take those issues forward as well. So the point is well made. We will we note the objectives, uh, the objections within the report to certain things that are taking place, the recommendations for improvement, and we will take them forward. Christine Graham, followed by Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the National Awareness Campaign on Child Protection. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, and most of us know, child abuse often takes place in the family home behind closed doors and to fa with families that are not known to social work. How can members of the public therefore report their awareness that there may be something untoward, and to whom should they report it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are a variety of ways in which that can happen. Uh, let me start within the confines of the children's legislation, where the legislation on the named person does give an opportunity for people to seek help and advice at a, an early stage. And I, I do think that's an important thing to happen. There are a variety of places. I would suggest that criminal action is always reported to the police. I, uh, there is no doubt that that is essential, that that should happen. Uh, suspicions of, of problems and difficulties should, could also be drawn to the attention of uh, a, a variety of, of, of agencies, including social work, including through the care inspectorate. There is no shortage of people to whom information can be given. But the member will know that the important first step is to recognise that there may be something wrong and in those circumstances to be determined to do something about it. Not in a negative way, 
But in a way, I outline the statement the importance of supporting every single individual child. Stuart Maxwell, followed by Jim Baxter. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the National Action Plan and, of course, the proposals for a national awareness campaign on child protection. However, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that schools have a vital role to play in tackling and preventing child sexual exploitation? And can the Cabinet Secretary outline what preventative education is currently available for our children and young people and what further plans the Scottish Government has in this area? Cabinet Secretary. It is important that we ask Education Scotland to consider that as an early matter and that will be done. I think it is also very important that individual teachers, both in their training in their CB and in their CP CPD, are alerted to these issues, and that is also an issue. But the national campaign we're announcing in the, um, in the action plan is about raising the awareness right across society, and I would expect teachers and schools to be a, an integral and central part of that. Jane Baxter, followed by Gil Patterson. One of the recommendations calls for the chief officers' groups to receive a report from child protection committees on the impact of health and social care partnerships on child protection and well-being, and to implement an urgent review. But how will this work in light, in light of COSLA's expectation, as expressed in evidence to the Education Committee this morning, that only one third of children's social work and health services will become integrated? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the legislation allowed for a variety of different models to emerge, and that legislation was passed by this chamber. And the reason that there would be a range of different models is they have to be appropriate to local circumstances. But what I have indicated in my statement is that we will bring together all those involved, uh, whether they're in the, in, in, in the um, uh, newly integrated models or not, to do that coordination. I've said we'll, we'll have that meeting this year because we need to bring together child protection committees, we need to bring together local authorities, we need to get, bring together uh, those involved in health and that integration so that all parts of the system uh, at that senior chair level and senior officer level are absolutely focused on the requirements. So I make the commitment to remember we'll do that. Uh, where the models vary, then we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that everybody's involved because nobody should be excluded from it. Gil Patterson, followed by David Stewart. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. And I can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement on this very important issue. Uh, the Chief Executive of the Care Inspector has said that generally arrangements for protecting vulnerable children and adults in Scotland are good, but there is no room for complacency. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline how he will ensure that there will be no complacency in this regard? Cabinet Secretary. I think, thank you, I thank the member for that question, because I think my entire statement has indicated uh, that the government has no complacency, indeed nobody in this who's involved in this issue, and that should be every single citizen in Scotland, can do anything other than, first of all, recall with horror at what some of the things that have taken place. Uh, they need, we all need to recognise that we have an individual role in preventing it taking place in the future, and therefore none of us can rest on this issue. But what I've outlined in detail in the statement is a range of, of actions that can be undertaken and will be undertaken by a range of organisations to make sure we make progress. Uh, Alexis J memorably observed in the Rotherham report that in, in an area where everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. What we have to do here is to make sure that it's not everyone who's responsible, it is each individual who takes responsibility. And that means each individual knows that there is action to be taken, and that's what we want to do. David Stewart, followed by Graham Day. Uh, Beside officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that the Petitions Committee, which I convene, provided a comprehensive report into child sexual exploitation, carried out after 12 months of exhaustive inquiry and concluded with 26 powerful and pertinent recommendations. Will the Cabinet Secretary use our 26 recommendations based on ex expert testimony across the UK and beyond as part of the natural, uh, National Action Plan, such as using risk of sexual harm orders more often and developing strategies to disrupt perpetrator activity? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, broadly, I'm, I'm entirely happy with that. I think that the committee made a very important contribution and nobody is rejecting that. I think we all, of course, we have to drill down into each of the recommendations. And if I can just touch on the, the risk of sexual um, offending, um, the orders, there are, that is a decision for prosecutors and for the police to take forward. It is based on individual circumstance. And I wouldn't want to create a blanket circumstance in which we were saying that's available and, and should be used in all circumstances. So 
I think we must be aware of the many variations and circumstances that exist. So if the <laughs> member will accept from me my <coughs> support for the conclusions that have been reached and my desire that everybody plays a part in this, I hope he will also accept from me my view that I would want to make sure that we were acting appropriately in every case and not necessarily applying blanket prescriptions, which might not be appropriate in some cases. Graham Day, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in many cases children do not recognise their own exploitation until some years after the abuse took place. Does he agree that this is one of the biggest barriers that we must overcome to tackle CSE? And can I ask him how he feels it might be overcome? Cabinet Secretary. I do think this is a considerable issue, and it is, it is in various uh, aspects that one sees it in, in, with particular concern. There are some people who do recover their memories, and I use that word not in its technical sense, and who are concerned by it, who need very strong support and help during that process, uh, and that should be available. And of course, the whole idea of the interaction process and going forward is to provide strong support and holistic help for those who, who have difficulties. So that, that's, that's a very important issue. There are also those people who go on suffering. I was very struck by somebody who, who told me a story of being taken into care when she was very young and being told she had no family and then discovering many years later that she had and she had never known that family and that was a continuing abuse throughout her life and we need to recognize that this is not a simple matter and it is not a matter that finishes for many people so in those circumstances we have a commitment as a society for lifetime care for those who are in these circumstances but it's not care that is simply of one nature. I, I go back to this phrase I used twice in my, my statement. The care must also aim to help those to move from surviving to living and thriving. And that's what we need to do. And all of our actions should be focused on that. Thank you. Given the importance of the statement, I intend to make sure that the three remaining speakers are called. So, Claudia Beamish, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary give any details of any additional funding for the development of the National Awareness Campaign on Child Protection, highlighted in the National Action Plan, in relation particularly to training, coordination, and very importantly, as I'm sure he will agree, monitoring of such a sensitive and complex strategy? Cabinet Secretary. I have given a commitment to support the implementation of this. Uh, and therefore, the cost of this will be met. I'm sorry not to be more precise than that, uh, but I do think it is important that we came forward with the right proposals, and then we said, let's find a way, and a way will be found to support these. So I can undertake that that will be done. And of course, as time goes on, I'll attach uh, both a projected expenditure and an actual expenditure to what we've undertaken. Liz Smith, then finally, Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, in your deliberations with the very considerable experts in this field and with the police, are you looking at specific models of local authority organisation which are best placed to, to produce the uh, best practice in this area? Cabinet Secretary. That's a very important question from Liz Smith. The answer is, I would want to make sure that the most effective models of practice are replicated or imitated. And I would want to make sure that there was a broad knowledge of those. That doesn't mean that I would want to impose a particular individual practice on every local authority. So what I do want to make sure is as the work continues and there's much good work going on, we, we learn where that is most effective and we encourage others to take that forward. There is you know, a, a desire in each local authority to get this right. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, but where the practices have not been as, as good as they should be, then they should move forward. We benefit from the work that the Care Inspectorate has done you know, over, over a, a period of time at looking at children's services. Uh, and I think it's fair to say, if I can just put it this way, we know what doesn't work. And we know where we have experienced those problems. And the Minister has been involved you know, with my support in making sure that we make absolutely clear that that is not acceptable and that there is substantial improvement sort. That we also, I think, do know where good practice exists and will encourage its replication. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement. To, ch to, to tackle child sexual abuse requires better information. Is Police Scotland using the new database which allows... It has a specific marker which allows accurate identification of individuals who may be at risk. And how are other agencies sharing this information? 
Can I think I would require to, to write to the member about that. The issue of Police Scotland database is a complex one. There are new databases being built and developed. Uh, I know the police are observing best practice in this, but I, would want, I don't want to answer the member without an absolute knowledge of that. And I'll ask my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for, for Justice, to provide that information so you have it. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Cabinet Secretary on Child Protection. We now move to the next debate, which is a debate on motion number 11484.